Chapter Ten of the Hound of the Baskervilles by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Bob Newfeld. Chapter Ten: Extract from the Diary of Doctor Watson. So far, I have been able to quote from the reports which I have forwarded during these early days to Sherlock Holmes. Now, however. I have arrived at a point in my narrative where I am compelled to abandon this method, and to trust once more to my recollections, aided by the diary which I kept at the time. A few extracts from the latter will carry me on to those scenes which are indelibly fixed in every detail upon my memory. I proceed, then, from the morning which followed our abortive chase of the convict, and our other strange experiences upon the moor. October 16th. A dull and foggy day, with a drizzle of rain. The house is banked in with rolling clouds, which rise now and then to show the dreary curves of the moor, with thin silver veins upon the sides of the hills, and the distant boulders gleaming where the light strikes upon their wet faces. It is melancholy, outside and in. The baronet is in a black reaction after the excitements of the night. I am conscious myself of a weight at my heart, and a feeling of impending danger, ever-present danger, which is the more terrible because I am unable to define it. And have I not cause for such a feeling? Consider the long sequence of incidents which have all pointed to some sinister influence which is at work around us. There is the death of the last occupant of the hall fulfilling so exactly the conditions of the family legend, and there are the repeated reports from peasants of the appearance of a strange creature upon the moor. Twice I have with my own ears heard the sound which resembled the distant baying of a hound. It is incredible, impossible, that it should really be outside the ordinary laws of nature. A spectral hound which leaves material footmarks and fills the air with its howling is surely not to be thought of. Stapleton may fall in with such a superstition, and Mortimer also, but if I have one quality upon earth, it is common sense, and nothing will persuade me to believe in such a thing. To do so would be to descend to the level of these poor peasants, who are not content with a mere fiend dog, but must needs describe him with hell-fire shooting from his mouth and eyes. Holmes would not listen to such fancies, and I am his agent. But facts are facts, and I have twice heard the crying upon the moor. Suppose that there were really some huge hound loose upon it. That would go far to explain everything. But where could such a hound lie concealed? Where did it get its food? Where did it come from? How is it that no one saw it by day? It must be confessed that the natural explanation offers almost as many difficulties as the other. And always, apart from the hound, there is the fact of the human agency in London, the man in the cab, and the letter which warned Sir Henry against the moor. This at least was real, but it might have been the work of a protecting friend as easily as of an enemy. Where is that friend or enemy now? Has he remained in London, or has he followed us down here? Could he be the stranger whom I saw upon the tour? It is true that I have had only the one glance at him, and yet there are some things to which I am ready to swear. He is no one whom I have seen down here, and I have now met all the neighbours. The figure was far taller than that of Stapleton, far thinner than that of Franklin. Barrymore it might possibly have been but we had left him behind us, and I am certain that he could not have followed us. A stranger, then, is still dogging us, just as a stranger dogged us in London. We have never shaken him off. If I could lay my hands upon that man, then at last we might find ourselves at the end of all of our difficulties. To this one purpose I must now devote all my energies. My first impulse was to tell Sir Henry all my plans. My second, and wisest one, 
is to play my own game and speak as little as possible to any one. He is silent and distrait. His nerves have been strangely shaken by that sound upon the moor. I will say nothing to add to his anxieties, but I will take my own steps to attain my own end. We had a small scene this morning after breakfast. Barrymore asked leave to speak with Sir Henry, and they were closeted in his study some little time. Sitting in the billiard-room, I more than once heard the sound of voices raised, and I had a pretty good idea what the point was which was under discussion. After a time, the baronet opened his door and called for me. "'Barrymore considers that he has a grievance,' he said. "'He thinks it was unfair on our part to hunt his brother-in-law down when he, of his own free will, had told us the secret.' The butler was standing very pale, but very collected before us. "'I may have spoken too warmly, sir,' said he, "'and if I have, I am sure that I beg your pardon. At the same time, I was very much surprised when I heard you two gentlemen come back this morning and learn that you had been chasing Selden. The poor fellow has enough to fight against without my putting more upon his track.' "'If you had told us of your own free will, it would have been a different thing,' said the baronet. "'You only told us, or rather your wife only told us, when it was forced from you, and you could not help yourself.' "'I didn't think you would have taken advantage of it, Sir Henry. Indeed, I didn't. The man is a public danger. There are lonely houses scattered over the moor, and he is a fellow who would stick at nothing.' You only want to get a glimpse of his face to see that. Look at Mr. Stapleton's house, for example, with no one but himself to defend it. There's no safety for anyone until he is under lock and key. He'll break into no house, sir. I give you my solemn word upon that. But he will never trouble anyone in the country again. I assure you, Sir Henry, that in a very few days the necessary arrangements will have been made and he will be on his way to South America. For God's sake, sir, I beg of you not to let the police know that he is still on the moor. They have given up the chase there, and he can lie quiet until the ship is ready for them. You can't tell on him without getting my wife and me into trouble. I beg you, sir, to say nothing to the police. What do you say, Watson? I shrugged my shoulders. If he were safely out of the country, it would relieve the taxpayer of a burden. But how about the chance of his holding someone up before he goes? He would not do anything so mad, sir. We have provided him with all that he can want. To commit a crime would be to show where he is hiding. That is true, said Sir Henry. Well, Barrymore, oh, God bless you, sir, and thank you from my heart. It would have killed my poor wife had he been taken again. I guess we are aiding and abetting a felony, Watson. But after what we have heard, I don't feel as if I could give the man up. So there is an end of it. All right, Barrymore, you can go. With a few broken words of gratitude, the man turned. But he hesitated and then came back. You have been so kind to us, sir that I should like to do the best I can for you in return. I know something, Sir Henry, and perhaps I should have said it before, but it was long after the inquest that I found it out. I've never breathed a word about it yet to mortal man. It's about poor Sir Charles's death. The baronet and I were both upon our feet. Do you know how he died? No, sir, I don't know that. Oh, what then? I know why he was at the gate at that hour. It was to meet a woman. To meet a woman? He? Yes, sir. And the woman's name? I can't give you the name, sir, but I can give you the initials. Her initials were L. L. And how do you know this, Barrymore? Well, Sir Henry, your uncle had a letter that morning. He had usually a great many letters, 
for he was a public man and well known for his kind heart, so that every one who was in trouble was glad to turn to him. But that morning, as it chanced, there was only this one letter, so I took the more notice of it. It was from Coombe Tracy, and it was addressed in a woman's hand. Well, well, sir, I thought no more of the matter, and never would have, had it not been for my wife. Only a few weeks ago she was cleaning out Sir Charles's study. It had never been touched since his death, and she found the ashes of a burned letter in the back of the grate. The greater part of it was charred to pieces, but one little slip, the end of a page, hung together, and the writing could still be read, though it was grey on a black ground. It seemed to us to be a postscript at the end of the letter, and it said, Please, please, as you are a gentleman, burn this letter, and be at the gate by ten o'clock. Beneath it were signed the initials L.L. Have you got that slip? No, sir. It crumbled all to bits after we moved it. Had Sir Charles received any other letters in the same writing? Well, sir, I took no particular notice of his letters. I should not have noticed this one, only it happened to come alone. And you have no idea who L. L. is? No, sir. No more than you have. But I expect that if we could lay our hands upon that lady, we should know more about Sir Charles's death. I cannot understand, Barrymore, how you come to conceal this important information. Well, sir, it was immediately after that our own trouble came to us. And then again, sir, we were both of us very fond of Sir Charles, as we well might be, considering all that he has done for us. To rake this up couldn't help our poor master, and it's well to go carefully when there's a lady in the case. Even the best of us, you thought it might injure his reputation. Well, sir, I thought no good could come of it. But now you have been kind to us, and I feel as if it would be treating you unfairly not to tell you all that I know about the matter. Very good, Barrymore. You can go. When the butler had left us, Sir Henry turned to me. Well, Watson, what do you think of this new light? It seems to leave the darkness rather blacker than before. So I think. But if we can only trace L.L., it should clear up the whole business. We have gained that much. We know that there is someone who has the facts, if we can only find her. What do you think we should do? Let Holmes know all about it at once. It will give him the clue for which he has been seeking. I am much mistaken if it does not bring him down. I went at once to my room, and drew up my report of the morning's conversation for Holmes. It was evident to me that he had been very busy of late, for the notes which I had from Baker Street were few and short, with no comments upon the information which I had supplied and hardly any reference to my mission. No doubt his blackmailing case is absorbing all his faculties, and yet this new factor must surely arrest his attention and renew his interest. I wish that he were here. October 17th All day to-day the rain poured down, rustling on the ivy and dripping from the eaves. I thought of the convict out upon the bleak, cold, shelterless moor. Poor devil! Whatever his crimes, he has suffered something to atone for them. And then I thought of that other one, the face in the cab, the figure against the moon. Was he also out there in that deluge, the unseen watcher, the man of darkness? In the evening I put on my waterproof, and walked far upon the sodden moor, full of dark imaginings, the rain beating upon my face, and the wind whistling about my ears. God help those who wander into the great mire now, for even the firm uplands are becoming a morass. I found the black tor upon which I had seen the solitary watcher, and from its craggy summit I looked out myself across the melancholy downs. Rain squalls drifted across their russet face, and the heavy slate-coloured clouds hung low over the landscape. 
trailing in gray wreaths down the sides of the fantastic hills. In the distant hollow on the left, half hidden by the mist, the two thin towers of Baskerville Hall rose above the trees. They were the only signs of human life which I could see, save only those prehistoric huts which lay thickly upon the slopes of the hills. Nowhere was there any trace of that lonely man whom I had seen on the same spot two nights before. As I walked back I was overtaken by Dr. Mortimer, driving in his dog-cart over a rough moorland track which led from the outlying farmhouse of Foulmire. He has been very attentive to us, and hardly a day has passed that he has not called at the hall to see how we were getting on. He insisted upon my climbing into his dog-cart, and he gave me a lift homeward. I found him much troubled over the disappearance of his little spaniel. It had wandered on to the moor and had never come back. I gave him such consolation as I might, but I thought of the pony on the Grimpen Mire, and I do not fancy that he will see his little dog again. "'By the way, Mortimer,' said I, as we jolted along the rough road, I suppose there are few people living within driving distance of this whom you do not know. Hardly any, I think. Can you, then, tell me the name of any woman whose initials are L.L.? He thought for a few minutes. No, said he. There are a few gypsies and laboring folks for whom I can't answer, but among the farmers or gentry there is no one whose initials are those. Wait a bit, though he added with a pause. There is Laura Lyons. Her initials are L.L., but she lives in Coombe Tracy. Who is she? I asked. She is Franklin's daughter. What, old Franklin the Crank? Exactly. She married an artist named Lyons, who came sketching on the moor. He proved to be a blackguard and deserted her. The fault, from what I hear, may not have been entirely on one side. Her father refused to have anything to do with her, because she had married without his consent, and perhaps for one or two other reasons as well. So, between the old sinner and the young one, the girl has had a pretty bad time. How does she live? I fancy old Franklin allows her a pittance, but it cannot be more, for his own affairs are considerably involved. Whatever she may have deserved, one could not allow her to go hopelessly to the band. Her story got about, and several of the people here did something to enable her to earn an honest living. Stapleton did for one, and Sir Charles for another. I gave a trifle myself. It was to set her up in a typewriting business. He wanted to know the object of my inquiries but I managed to satisfy his curiosity without telling him too much, for there is no reason why we should take anyone into our confidence. Tomorrow morning I shall find my way to Coombe Tracy, and if I can see this Mrs. Laura Lyons, of equivocal reputation, a long step will have been made towards clearing one incident in this chain of mysteries. I am certainly developing the wisdom of the serpent, for when Mortimer pressed his questions to an inconvenient extent, I asked him casually to what type Franklin's skull belonged, and so heard nothing but craniology for the rest of our drive. I have not lived for years with Sherlock Holmes for nothing. I have only one other incident to record upon this tempestuous and melancholy day. This was my conversation with Barrymore just now which gives me one more strong card which I can play in due time. Mortimer had stayed to dinner, and he and the baronet played écarté afterwards. The butler brought me my coffee into the library, and I took the chance to ask him a few questions. Well, said I, has this precious relation of yours departed, or is he still lurking out yonder? I don't know, sir. I hope to heaven that he has gone for he has brought nothing but trouble here. I have not heard of him since I left out food for him last, and that was three days ago. Did you see him then? No, sir, 
but the food was gone when next I went that way. Then he was certainly there? So you would think, sir, unless it was the other man who took it. I sat with my coffee cup halfway to my lips and stared at Barrymore. You know that there is another man, then? Yes, sir, there is another man upon the moor. Have you seen him? No, sir. How do you know of him, then? Selden told me of him, sir, a week ago or more. He's in hiding, too, but he's not a convict, as far as I can make out. I don't like it, Dr. Watson. I tell you straight, sir, that I don't like it. He spoke with a sudden passion of earnestness. Now listen to me, Barrymore. I have no interest in this matter but that of your master. I have come here with no object except to help him. Tell me frankly what it is that you don't like." Barrymore hesitated for a moment, as if he regretted his outburst, or found it difficult to express his own feelings in words. "'It's all these goings-on, sir,' he cried at last, waving his hand towards the rain-lashed window which forced the moor. "'There's foul play somewhere, and there's black villainy brewing. To that I'll swear. Very glad I should be, sir, to see Sir Henry on his way back to London again. But what is it that alarms you? Oh, look at Sir Charles's death. That was bad enough for all that the coroner said. Look at the noises on the moor at night. There's not a man would cross it after sundown if he was paid for it. Look at this stranger hiding out yonder, and watching and waiting. What's he waiting for? What does it mean? It means no good to any one of the name of Baskerville, and very glad I shall be to be quit of it all on the day that Sir Henry's new servants are ready to take over the hall. But what about this stranger? said I. Can you tell me anything about him? What did Selden say? Did he find out where he hid, or what he was doing? He saw him once or twice, but he is a deep one and gives nothing away. At first he thought that he was the police, but soon he found that he had some lay of his own. A kind of gentleman he was, as far as he could see, but what he was doing he could not make out. And where did he say that he lived? Among the old houses on the hillside, the stone huts where the old folk used to live. But what about his food? Selden found out that he has got a lad who works for him, and brings him all he needs. I dare say he goes to Coombe Tracy for what he wants. Very good, Barrymore. We may talk further of this some other time. When the butler had gone, I walked over to the black window, and I looked through a blurred pane at the driving clouds and at the tossing outline of the wind-swept trees. It was a wild night indoors and what must it be in a stone hut upon the moor? What passion of hatred can it be which leads a man to lurk in such a place at such a time? And what deep and earnest purpose can he have which calls for such a trial? There, in that hut upon the moor, seems to lie the very centre of that problem which has vexed me so sorely. I swear that another day shall not have passed before I have done all that man can do to reach the heart of the mystery. End of chapter 10、Chapter、Eleven of The Hound of the Baskervilles by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Bob Newfeld. Chapter Eleven The Man on the Tour. The extract from my private diary, which forms the last chapter, has brought my narrative up to the eighteenth of October, a time when these strange events began to move swiftly towards their terrible conclusion. The incidents of the next few days are indelibly graven upon my recollection, and I can tell them without reference to the notes made at the time. I start, then, from the day which succeeded that upon which I had established two facts of great importance. 
the one that mrs laura lyons of coombe tracy had written to sir charles baskerville and made an appointment with him at the very place and hour that he met his death the other that the lurking man upon the moor was to be found among the stone huts upon the hillside with these two facts in my possession i felt that either my intelligence or my courage must be deficient if i could not throw some further light upon these dark places i had no opportunity to tell the baronet what i had learned about mrs lyons upon the evening before for dr mortimer remained with him at cards until it was very late at breakfast however i informed him about my discovery and asked him whether he would care to accompany me to coombe tracy at first he was very eager to come but on second thoughts it seemed to both of us that if i went alone the results might be better the more formal we made the visit the less information we might obtain i left sir henry behind therefore not without some pricklings of conscience and drove off upon my new quest when i reached coombe tracy i told perkins to put up the horses and i made inquiries for the lady whom i had come to interrogate i had no difficulty in finding her rooms which were central and well appointed a maid showed me in without ceremony and as i entered the sitting-room a lady who was sitting before a remington typewriter sprang up with a pleasant smile of welcome her face fell however when she saw that i was a stranger and she sat down again and asked me the object of my visit the first impression left by mrs lyons was one of extreme beauty her eyes and hair were of the same rich hazel colour and her cheeks though considerably freckled were flushed with the exquisite bloom of the brunette the dainty pink which lurks at the heart of the sulphur rose admiration was i repeat the first impression but the second was criticism there was something subtly wrong with the face some coarseness of expression some hardness perhaps of eye some looseness of lip which marred its perfect beauty but these of course are afterthoughts at the moment i was simply conscious that i was in the presence of a very handsome woman and that she was asking me the reasons for my visit i had not quite understood it until that instant how delicate my mission was i have the pleasure said i of knowing your father it was a clumsy introduction and the lady made me feel it there is nothing in common between my father and me i owe him nothing and his friends are not mine if it were not for the late sir charles baskerville and some other kind hearts i might have starved for all that my father cared it was about the late sir charles baskerville that i have come here to see you the freckles started out on the lady's face what can i tell you about him she asked and her fingers played nervously over the stops of her typewriter oh you knew him did you not i have already said that i owe a great deal to his kindness if i am able to support myself it is largely due to the interest which he took in my unhappy situation did you correspond with him the lady looked quickly up with an angry gleam in her hazel eyes what is the object of these questions she asked sharply the object is to avoid a public scandal it is better that i should ask them here than that the matter should pass outside our control she was silent and her face was still very pale at last she looked up with something reckless and defiant in her manner well i'll answer she said what are your questions did you correspond with sir charles i certainly wrote to him once or twice to acknowledge his delicacy and his generosity have you the dates of those letters no have you ever met him yes once or twice when he came to coombe tracy he was a very retiring man and he preferred to do good by stealth but if you saw him so seldom and wrote so seldom how did he know enough about your affairs to be able to help you as you say that he has done 
she met my difficulty with the utmost readiness. There were several gentlemen who knew my sad history, and united to help me. One was Mr. Stapleton, a neighbor and intimate friend of Sir Charles's. He was exceedingly kind, and it was through him that Sir Charles learned about my affairs. I knew already that Sir Charles Baskerville had made Stapleton his almoner upon several occasions, so the lady's statement bore the impress of truth upon it. "'Did you ever write to Sir Charles asking him to meet you?' I continued. Mrs. Lyons flushed with anger again. "'Really, sir, this is a very extraordinary question.' "'I am sorry, madam, but I must repeat it. Then I answer, certainly not.' "'Not on the very day of Sir Charles's death?' The flush had faded in an instant, and a deathly face was before me. Her dry lips could not speak the no which I saw rather than heard. "'Surely your memory deceives you,' said I. I could even quote a passage of your letter. It ran, "'Please, please, as you are a gentleman, burn this letter and be at the gate by ten o'clock.' I thought she had fainted but she recovered herself by a supreme effort. "'Is there no such thing as a gentleman?' she gasped. "'You do Sir Charles an injustice. He did burn the letter, but sometimes a letter may be legible even when burned. You acknowledge now that you wrote it?' "'Yes, I did write it,' she cried, pouring out her soul in a torrent of words. I did write it. Why should I deny it? I have no reason to be ashamed of it. I wished him to help me. I believed that if I had an interview I could gain his help, so I asked him to meet me. But why at such an hour? Because I had only learned that he was going to London next day and might be away for months. There were reasons why I could not get there earlier. But why a rendezvous in the garden instead of a visit to the house? Do you think a woman could go alone at that hour to a bachelor's house? Well, what happened when you did get there? I never went, Mrs. Lyons. No, I swear it to you, on all I hold sacred, I never went. Something intervened to prevent my going. What was that? That is a private matter. I cannot tell it. You acknowledge, then, that you made an appointment with Sir Charles at the very hour and place at which he met his death, but you deny that you kept the appointment. That is the truth. Again and again I cross-questioned her, but I could never get past that point. Mrs. Lyons, said I, as I rose from this long and inclusive interview, you are taking a very great responsibility, and putting yourself in a very false position by not making an absolutely clean breast of all that you know. If I have to call in the aid of the police, you will find how seriously you are compromised. If your position is innocent, why did you in the first instance deny having written to Sir Charles upon that date? because i feared that some false conclusion might be drawn from it and that i might find myself involved in a scandal and why were you so pressing that sir charles should destroy your letter if you have read the letter you will know i did not say that i had read all the letter you quoted some of it i quoted the postscript the letter had, as I said, been burned, and it was not all legible. I ask you once again why it was that you are so pressing that Sir Charles should destroy this letter, which he received on the day of his death. The matter is a very private one. The more reason why you should avoid a public investigation. I will tell you, then. If you have heard anything of my unhappy history, you will know that I made a rash marriage and had reason to regret it. I have heard so much. My life has been one incessant persecution from a husband whom I abhor. 
the law is upon his side and every day i am faced by the possibility that he may force me to live with him at the time that i wrote this letter to sir charles i had learned that there was a prospect of my regaining my freedom if certain expenses could be met it meant everything to me peace of mind happiness self-respect everything i knew sir charles's generosity and i thought that if he heard the story from my lips he would help me then how is it that you did not go because i received help in the interval from another source why then did you not write to sir charles and explain this so i should have done had i not seen his death in the paper next morning the woman's story hung coherently together and all my questions were unable to shake it i could only check it by finding if she had indeed instituted divorce proceedings against her husband at or about the time of the tragedy it was unlikely that she would dare to say that she had not been to baskerville hall if she really had been for a trap would be necessary to take her there and could not have returned to Coombe Tracy until the early hours of the morning. Such an excursion could not be kept secret. The probability was, therefore, that she was telling the truth, or at least a part of the truth. I came away baffled and disheartened. Once again I had reached that dead wall which seemed to be built across every path by which I tried to get at the object of my mission and yet the more i thought of the lady's face and of her manner the more i felt that something was being held back from me why should she turn so pale why should she fight against every admission until it was forced from her why should she have been so reticent at the time of the tragedy surely the explanation of all this could not be as innocent as she would have me believe for the moment i could proceed no farther in that direction but must turn back to that other clue which was to be sought for among the stone huts upon the moor. And that was a most vague direction. I realized it as I drove back, and noted how hill after hill showed traces of the ancient people. Barrymore's only indication had been that the stranger lived in one of these abandoned huts, and many hundreds of them are scattered throughout the length and breadth of the moor but i had my own experience for a guide since it had shown me the man himself standing upon the summit of the black tor that then should be the centre of my search from there i should explore every hut upon the moor until i lighted upon the right one if this man were inside it i should find out from his own lips at the point of my revolver if necessary who he was, and why he had dogged us so long. He might slip away from us in the crowd of Regent Street, but it would puzzle him to do so upon the lonely moor. On the other hand, if I should find the hut and its tenant should not be within it, I must remain there, however long the vigil, until he returned. Holmes had missed him in London. It would indeed be a triumph for me if i could run him to earth where my master had failed luck had been against us again and again in this inquiry but now at last it came to my aid and the messenger of good fortune was none other than mr frankland who was standing grey-whiskered and red-faced outside the gate of his garden which opened on to the high road along which i travelled "'Good day, Mr. Watson,' cried he, with unwonted good humour. "'You must really give your horses a rest, and come in to have a glass of wine and to congratulate me.' My feelings towards him were very far from being friendly, after what I had heard of his treatment of his daughter, but I was anxious to send Perkins in the wagonette home, and the opportunity was a good one. I alighted and sent a message to Sir Henry, that I should walk over in time for dinner. Then I followed Franklin into his dining-room. "'It is a great day for me, sir, one of the red-letter days of my life,' he cried with many chuckles. 
I have brought off a double event. I mean to teach them in those parts that law is law, and that there is a man here who does not fear to invoke it. I have established a right-of-way through the centre of old Middleton's Park, slap across it, sir, within a hundred yards of his own front door. What do you think of that? We'll teach these magnates that they cannot ride roughshod over the rights of the commoners. Confound them! And I've closed the wood where the fernworthy folk used to picnic. These infernal people seem to think that there are no rights of property, and that they can swarm where they like with their papers and their bottles. Both cases decided, Dr. Watson, and both in my favour. I haven't had such a day since I had Sir John Morland for trespass, because he was shot in his old warren. How on earth did you do that? Look it up in the books, sir. It will repay reading. Franklin versus Morland, Court of Queen's Bench. It cost me two hundred pounds, but I got my verdict. Did it do any good? None, sir. None. I am proud to say that I had no interest in the matter. I act entirely from a sense of public duty. I have no doubt, for example, that the fernworthy people will burn me in effigy to-night. I told the police last time they did it that they should stop these disgraceful exhibitions. The county constabulary is in a scandalous state, sir, and it has not afforded me the protection to which I am entitled. The case of Franklin versus Regina will bring the matter before the attention of the public. I told them that they would have occasion to regret their treatment of me, and already my words have come true. How so? I asked. The old man put on a very knowing expression. Because I could tell them what they are dying to know, but nothing would induce me to help the rascals in any way. I had been casting round for some excuse by which I could get away from his gossip, but now I began to wish to hear more of it. I had seen enough of the contrary nature of the old sinner to understand that any strong sign of interest would be the surest way to stop his confidences. "'Some poaching case, no doubt,' said I, with an indifferent manner. "'Ha! ha! my boy! A very much more important matter than that.' What about the convict on the moor? I started. You don't mean that you know where he is, said I. I may not know exactly where he is, but I am quite sure that I could help the police to lay their hands on him. Has it never struck you that the way to catch that man was to find out where he got his food and so trace it to him? He certainly seemed to be getting uncomfortably near the truth. No doubt, said I. But how do you know that he is anywhere upon the moor? I know it because I have seen with my own eyes the messenger who takes him his food. My heart sank for Barrymore. It was a serious thing to be in the power of this spiteful old busybody. But his next remark took a weight from my mind. You'll be surprised to hear that his food is taken to him by a child. I see him every day through my telescope upon the roof. He passes along the same path at the same hour, and to whom should he be going except to the convict? Here was luck indeed, and yet I suppressed all appearance of interest. A child! Barrymore had said that our unknown was supplied by a boy. It was on his track, and not upon the convict's, that Franklin had stumbled. If I could get his knowledge, it might save me a long and weary hunt. But incredulity and indifference were evidently my strongest card. I should say that it was much more likely that it was the son of one of the moorland shepherds taking out his father's dinner. The least appearance of opposition struck fire out of the old autocrat. His eyes looked malignantly at me, and his grey whiskers bristled like those of an angry cat. "'Indeed, sir! 
said he, pointing out over the wide-stretching moor. Do you see that black tor over yonder? Well, do you see the low hill beyond with the thorn-bush upon it? It is the stoniest part of the whole moor. Is that a place where a shepherd would be likely to take his station? Your suggestion, sir, is a most absurd one. I meekly answered that I had spoken without knowing all the facts. My submission pleased him, and led him to further confidences. You may be sure, sir, that I have very good grounds before I come to an opinion. I have seen the boy again and again with his bundle, every day, and sometimes twice a day. I have been able— But wait a moment, Dr. Watson. Do my eyes deceive me, or is there at the present moment something moving upon that hillside? It was several miles off, but I could distinctly see a small dark dot against the dull green and grey. "'Come, sir, come!' cried Franklin, rushing upstairs. "'You will see with your own eyes, and judge for yourself.' The telescope, a formidable instrument mounted upon a tripod, stood upon the flat leads of the house. Franklin clapped his eye to it, and gave a cry of satisfaction. "'Quick, Dr. Watson, quick, before he passes over the hill!' There he was, sure enough a small urchin with a little bundle upon his shoulder, toiling slowly up the hill. When he reached the crest, I saw the ragged, uncouth figure outlined for an instant against the cold blue sky. He looked round him with a furtive and stealthy air, as one who dreads pursuit. Then he vanished over the hill. "'Well, am I right?' "'Certainly there is a boy who seems to have some secret errand.' and what the errand is even a county constable could guess. But not one word shall they have from me, and I bind you to secrecy also, Dr. Watson. Not a word, you understand? Just as you wish. They have treated me shamefully, shamefully. When the facts come out in Franklin versus Regina, I venture to think that a thrill of indignation will run through the country. Nothing would induce me to help the police in any way. For all they cared, it might have been me instead of my effigy which these rascals burned at the stake. Well, surely you're not going. You will help me to empty the decanter in honour of this great occasion. But I resisted all his solicitations, and succeeded in dissuading him from his announced intention of walking home with me. I kept the road as long as his eye was on me, and then I struck off across the moor, and made for the stony hill over which the boy had disappeared. Everything was working in my favour, and I swore that it should not be through lack of energy or perseverance that I should miss the chance which fortune had thrown in my way. The sun was already sinking when I reached the summit of the hill and the long slopes beneath me were all golden-green on one side and grey shadow on the other. A haze lay low upon the farther skyline, out of which jutted the fantastic shapes of Belliver and Vixen Tor. Over the wide expanse there was no sound and no movement. One great grey bird, a gull or curlew, soared aloft in the blue heaven. He and I seemed to be the only living things between the huge arch of the sky and the desert beneath it. The barren scene, the sense of loneliness, and the mystery and urgency of my task all struck a chill into my heart. The boy was nowhere to be seen. But down beneath me, in a cleft of the hills, there was a circle of the old stone huts, and in the middle of them, there was one which retained sufficient roof to act as a screen against the weather. My heart leaped within me as I saw it. This must be the burrow where the stranger lurked. At last my foot was on the threshold of his hiding-place. His secret was within my grasp. As I approached the hut, walking as warily as Stapleton would do when with the poised net he drew near the settled butterfly, 
I satisfied myself that the place had indeed been used as a habitation. A vague pathway among the boulders led to the dilapidated opening which served as a door. All was silent within. The unknown might be lurking there, or he might be prowling the moor. My nerves tingled with a sense of adventure. Throwing aside my cigarette, I closed my hand upon the butt of my revolver, and, walking swiftly up to the door, I looked in. The place was empty. But there were ample signs that I had not come upon a false scent. This was certainly where the man lived. Some blankets rolled in a waterproof lay upon that very stone slab upon which Neolithic man had once slumbered. The ashes of a fire were heaped in a rude grate. Beside it lay some cooking utensils and a bucket half full of water. A litter of empty tins showed that the place had been occupied for some time, and I saw, as my eyes became accustomed to the checkered light, a pannikin and a half-full bottle of spirits standing in the corner. In the middle of the hut a flat stone served the purpose of a table, and upon this stood a small cloth bundle, the same, no doubt, which I had seen through the telescope upon the shoulder of the boy. It contained a loaf of bread, a tinned tongue, and two tins of preserved peaches. As I set it down again, after having examined it, my heart leaped to see that beneath it there lay a sheet of paper with writing upon it. I raised it, and this was what I read, roughly scrawled in pencil. Dr. Watson has gone to Coombe Tracy. For a minute I stood there with the paper in my hands, thinking out the meaning of this curt message. It was I, then, and not Sir Henry, who was being dogged by this secret man. He had not followed me himself, but he had set an agent, the boy, perhaps, upon my track, and this was his report. Possibly I had taken no step since I had been upon the moor which had not been observed and reported. Always there was this feeling of an unseen force, a fine net drawn round us with infinite skill and delicacy, holding us so lightly that it was only at some supreme moment that one realized that one was indeed entangled in its meshes. If there was one report, there might be others, so I looked round the hut in search of them. There was no trace, however, of anything of the kind, nor could I discover any sign which might indicate the character or intentions of the man who lived in this singular place, save that he must be of Spartan habits and cared little for the comforts of life. When I thought of the heavy rains and looked at the gaping roof, I understood how strong and immutable must be the purpose which had kept him in that inhospitable abode. Was he our malignant enemy, or was he by chance our guardian angel? I swore that I would not leave the huts until I knew. Outside the sun was sinking low, the west was blazing with scarlet and gold. Its reflection was shot back in ruddy patches by the distant pools which lay amid the great Grimpen Mire. There were the two towers of Baskerville Hall, and there a distant blur of smoke which marked the village of Grimpen. Between the two, behind the hill, was the house of the Stapletons. All was sweet and mellow and peaceful in the golden evening light, and yet, as I looked at them, my soul shared none of the peace of nature, but quivered at the vagueness and the terror of that interview which every instant was bringing nearer. With tingling nerves, but a fixed purpose, I sat in the dark recess of the hut, and waited with sombre patience for the coming of its tenant. And then, at last, I heard him. Far away came the sharp clink of a boot striking upon a stone. Then another, and yet another, coming nearer and nearer. I shrank back into the darkest corner, and cocked the pistol in my pocket, determined not to discover myself until I had an opportunity of seeing something of the stranger. 
there was a long pause which showed that he had stopped then once more the footsteps approached and a shadow fell across the opening of the hut it is a lovely evening my dear watson said a well-known voice i really think that you will be more comfortable outside than in End of chapter 11Chapter Twelve of *The Hound of the Baskervilles* by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Bob Neufeld. Chapter Twelve: Death on the Moor. For a moment or two, I sat breathless, hardly able to believe my ears. Then my senses and my voice came back to me while a crushing weight of a responsibility seemed in an instant to be lifted from my soul that cold incisive ironical voice could belong to but one man in all the world holmes i cried holmes come out said he and please be careful with that revolver i stooped under the rude lintel and there he sat upon a stone outside his gray eyes dancing with amusement as they fell upon my astonished features. He was thin and worn, but clear and alert, his keen face bronzed by the sun and roughened by the wind. In his tweed suit and cloth cap he looked like any other tourist upon the moor, and he had contrived, with that cat-like love of personal cleanliness which was one of his characteristics, that his chin should be as smooth and his linen as perfect as if he were in baker street i never was more glad to see any one in my life said i as i wrung him by the hand or oh, more astonished eh well i i must confess to it the surprise was not all on one side i assure you i had no idea that you had found my occasional retreat still less that you were inside it until I was within twenty paces of the door. My footprint, I presume. No, Watson, I fear that I could not undertake to recognize your footprint amid all the footprints of the world. If you seriously desire to deceive me, you must change your tobacconist, for when I saw the stub of a cigarette marked Bradley Oxford Street, I knew that my friend Watson is in the neighborhood. You will see it there, beside the path. You threw it down, no doubt, at that supreme moment when you charged into the empty hut. Exactly. I thought as much, and knowing your admirable tenacity, I was convinced that you were sitting in ambush, a weapon within reach, waiting for the tenant to return. So, you actually thought that I was the criminal? I did not know who you were but I was determined to find out. Excellent, Watson. And how did you localize me? You saw me, perhaps, on the night of the convict hunt, when I was so imprudent as to allow the moon to rise behind me. Yes, I saw you then. And have no doubt searched all the huts until you came to this one. No, your boy had been observed, and that gave me a guide where to look. The old gentleman with the telescope, no doubt. I could not make it out when first I saw the light flashing upon the lens. He rose and peeped into the hut. Ha! Ah, I see that Cartwright has brought up some supplies. What's this paper? So you have been to Coombe Tracy, have you? Yes. To see Mrs. Laura Lyons? Oh, exactly. Well done. Our researches have evidently been running along parallel lines and when we unite our results i expect we shall have a fairly full knowledge of the case well i am glad from my heart that you are here for indeed the responsibility and the mystery were both becoming too much for my nerves but how in the name of wonder did you come here and what have you been doing i thought that you were in baker street working out that case of the blackmailing that is what i wished you to think then you use me, and yet do not trust me, 
I cried with some bitterness. I think that I had deserved better at your hands, Holmes. My dear fellow, you have been invaluable to me in this, as in many other cases, and I beg that you will forgive me if I have seemed to play a trick upon you. In truth, it was partly for your own sake that I did it, and it was my appreciation of the danger which you ran which led me to come down and examine the matter for myself. Had I been with Sir Henry and you, it is confident that my point of view would have been the same as yours, and my presence would have warned our very formidable opponents to be on their guard. As it is, I have been able to get about as I could not possibly have done had I been living in the hall, and I remain an unknown factor in the business, ready to throw in all my weight at a critical moment. But why keep me in the dark? For you to know could not have helped us, and might possibly have led to my discovery. You would have wished to tell me something, or, in your kindness, you would have brought me out some comfort or other, and so an unnecessary risk would be run. I brought Cartwright down with me. You remember the little chap at the express office, and he has seen after my simple wants, a loaf of bread and a clean collar. What does man want more? He has given me an extra pair of eyes upon a very active pair of feet, and both have been invaluable. Then my reports have all been wasted. My voice trembled as I recalled the pains and the pride with which I had composed them. Holmes took a bundle of papers from his pocket. Here are your reports, my dear fellow, and very well thumbed, I assure you. I made excellent arrangements, and they are only delayed one day upon their way. I must compliment you exceedingly upon the zeal and the intelligence which you have shown over an extraordinarily difficult case. I was still rather raw over the deception which had been practised upon me, but the warmth of Holmes's praise drove my anger from my mind. I felt also in my heart that he was right in what he said, and that it was really best for our purpose that I should not have known that he was upon the moor. "'That's better!' said he, seeing the shadow rise from my face. And now, tell me the result of your visit to Mrs. Laura Lyons. It was not difficult for me to guess that it was to see her that you had gone, for I am already aware that she is the one person in Coombe Tracy who might be of service to us in the matter. In fact, if you had not gone to-day, it is exceedingly probable that I should have gone to-morrow. The sun had set and dusk was settling over the moor. The air had turned chill, and we withdrew into the hut for warmth. There, sitting together in the twilight, I told Holmes of my conversation with the lady. So interested was he that I had to repeat some of it twice before he was satisfied. "'This is most important,' said he, when I had concluded. "'It fills up a gap which I had been unable to bridge in this most complex affair.' You are aware, perhaps, that a close intimacy exists between this lady and the man Stapleton? I did not know of a close intimacy. There can be no doubt about the matter. They meet, they write, there is a complete understanding between them. Now, this puts a very powerful weapon into our hands. If I could only use it to detach his wife. His wife? I am giving you some information now, in return for all that you have given me. The lady who has passed here as Miss Stapleton is in reality his wife. Good heavens, Holmes! Are you sure of what you say? How could he have permitted Sir Henry to fall in love with her? Sir Henry's falling in love could do no harm to anyone except Sir Henry. He took particular care that Sir Henry did not make love to her as you have yourself observed. I repeat that the lady is his wife, and not his sister. But why this elaborate deception? Because he foresaw that she would be very much more useful to him in the character of a free woman. All my unspoken instincts, my vague suspicions, suddenly took shape and centered upon the naturalist. In that impassive, colourless man, with his straw hat and his butterfly net, 
I seemed to see something terrible, a creature of infinite patience and craft, with a smiling face and a murderous heart. It is he, then, who is our enemy. It is he who dogged us in London. So I read the riddle. And the warning, it must have come from her. Exactly. The shape of some monstrous villainy, half seen, half guessed, loomed through the darkness which had girt me so long. But are you sure of this, Holmes? How do you know that the woman is his wife? Because he so far forgot himself as to tell you a true piece of autobiography upon the occasion when he first met you, and I dare say he has many a time regretted it since. He was once a schoolmaster in the north of England. Now there is no one more easy to trace than a schoolmaster. There are scholastic agencies by which one may identify any man who has been in the profession. A little investigation showed me that a school had come to grief under atrocious circumstances, and that the man who had owned it, the name was different, had disappeared with his wife. The descriptions agreed. When I learned that the missing man was devoted to entomology, the identification was complete. The darkness was rising, but much was still hidden by the shadows. For if this woman is in truth his wife, where does Mrs. Laura Lyons come in? I asked. That is one of the points upon which your own researches have shed a light. Your interview with the lady has cleared the situation very much. I did not know about a projected divorce between herself and her husband. In that case, regarding Stapleton as an unmarried man, she counted no doubt upon becoming his wife. And when she is undeceived? Why, then we may find the lady of service. It must be our first duty to see her, both of us, to-morrow. Don't you think, Watson, that you are away from your charge rather long? Your place should be at Baskerville Hall. The last red streaks had faded away in the west, and night had settled upon the moor. A few faint stars were gleaming in a violet sky. "'One last question, Holmes,' I said, as I rose. "'Surely there is no need of secrecy between you and me. What is the meaning of it all? What is he after?' Holmes's voice sank as he answered. "'It is murder, Watson.' Refined, cold-blooded, deliberate murder. Do not ask me for particulars. My nets are closing upon him, even as his are upon Sir Henry, and with your help he is already almost at my mercy. There is but one danger which can threaten us. It is that he should strike before we are ready to do so. Another day, two at the most, and I have my case complete. But until then, guard your charge as closely as ever a fond mother watched her ailing child. Your mission to-day has justified itself, and yet I could almost wish that you had not left his side. Hark! A terrible scream, a prolonged yell of horror and anguish, burst out of the silence of the moor. That frightful cry turned the blood to ice in my veins. Oh, my God! I gasped. What is it? What does it mean? Holmes had sprung to his feet, and I saw his dark athletic outline at the door of the hut, his shoulders stooping, his head thrust forward, his face peering into the darkness. Hush! he whispered. Hush! The cry had been loud on account of its vehemence, but it pealed out from somewhere far off on the shadowy plain. Now it burst upon our ears, nearer, louder, more urgent than before. "'Where is it?' Holmes whispered, and I knew from the thrill of his voice that he, the man of iron, was shaken to the soul. "'Where is it, Watson?' Well, "'There, I think,' I pointed into the darkness. "'No, there!' Again the agonized cry swept through the silent night, louder and much nearer than ever, and a new sound mingled with it, a deep muttered rumble, musical and yet menacing, 
rising and falling like the low, constant murmur of the sea. "'The hound!' cried Holmes. "'Come, Watson, come! Great heavens, if we are too late!' He had started running swiftly over the moor, and I had followed at his heels, but now from somewhere among the broken ground immediately in front of us there came one last despairing yell, and then a dull, heavy thud. We halted and listened. Not another sound broke the heavy silence of the windless night. I saw Holmes put his hand to his forehead like a man distracted. He stamped his feet upon the ground. "'He has beaten us, Watson. We are too late.' "'No, no, surely not. Fool that I was to hold my hand. And you, Watson, see what comes of abandoning your charge. But, by heaven, if the worst has happened, we'll avenge him.' Blindly we ran through the gloom blundering across boulders, forcing our way through gorse bushes, panting up hills and rushing down slopes, heading always in the direction whence those dreadful sounds had come. At every rise Holmes looked eagerly around him, but the shadows were thick upon the moor, and nothing moved upon its dreary face. "'Can you see anything?' "'Nothing. But, hark, what is that?' A low moan had fallen upon our ears. There it was again, upon our left. On that side a ridge of rocks ended in a sheer cliff which overlooked a stone-strewn slope. On its jagged face was spread-eagled some dark, irregular object. As we ran towards it, the vague outline hardened into a definite shape. It was a prostrate man, face downward upon the ground the head doubled under him at a horrible angle, the shoulders rounded, and the body hunched together as if in the act of throwing a somersault. So grotesque was the attitude that I could not for an instant realize that that moan had been the passing of his soul. Not a whisper, not a rustle, rose now from the dark figure over which we stooped. Holmes laid his hand upon him, and held it up again with an exclamation of horror. The gleam of the match which he struck shone upon his clotted fingers, and upon the ghastly pool which widened slowly from the crushed skull of the victim. And it shone upon something else which turned our hearts sick and faint within us. The body of Sir Henry Baskerville. There was no chance of either of us forgetting that peculiar ruddy tweed suit, the very one which he had worn on the first morning that we had seen him in Baker Street. We caught the one clear glimpse of it, and then the match flickered and went out, even as the hope had gone out of our souls. Holmes groaned, and his face glimmered white through the darkness. "'The brute! The brute!' I cried with clenched hands. Oh, Holmes, I shall never forgive myself for having left him to his fate. I am more to blame than you, Watson. In order to have my case well rounded and complete, I have thrown away the life of my client. It is the greatest blow which has befallen me in my career. But how could I know, how could I know that he would risk his life alone upon the moor in the face of all my warnings? that we should have heard his screams. My God, those screams! And yet have been unable to save him. Where is this brute of a hound which drove him to his death? It may be lurking among these rocks at this instant. And Stapleton, where is he? He shall answer for this deed. He shall. I will see to that. Uncle and nephew have been murdered the one frightened to death by the very sight of a beast which he thought to be supernatural, the other driven to his end in his wild flight to escape from it. But now we have to prove the connection between the man and the beast. Say from what we heard, we cannot even swear to the existence of the latter, since Sir Henry has evidently died from the fall. But, by heavens, cunning as he is, the fellow shall be in my power before another day is past. 
we stood with bitter hearts on either side of the mangled body overwhelmed by this sudden and irrevocable disaster which had brought all our long and weary labours to so piteous an end then as the moon rose we climbed to the top of the rocks over which our poor friend had fallen and from the summits we gazed out over the shadowy moor half silver and half gloom far away miles off in the direction of grimpen a single steady yellow light was shining it could only come from the lonely abode of the stapletons with a bitter curse i shook my fist at it as i gazed why should we not seize him at once our case is not complete the fellow is wary and cunning to the last degree it's not what we know but what we can prove if we make one false move the villain may escape us yet what can we do there will be plenty for us to do to-morrow to-night we can only perform the last offices to our poor friend together we made our way down the precipitous slope and approached the body black and clear against the silvered stone the agony of those contorted limbs struck me with a spasm of pain and blurred my eyes with tears we must send for help holmes they cannot carry him all the way to the hall good heavens are you mad he had uttered a cry and bent over the body now he was dancing and laughing and wringing my hand could this be my stern self-contained friend these were hidden fires indeed a beard a beard the man has a beard a beard it is not the baronet it is why it is my neighbor the convict with feverish haste we had turned the body over and that dripping beard was pointing up to the cold clear moon there could be no doubt about the beetling forehead the sunken animal eyes it was indeed the same face which had glared upon me in the light of the candle from over the rock the voice of selden the criminal then in an instant it was all clear to me i remembered how the baronet had told me that he had handed his old wardrobe to barrymore barrymore had passed it on in order to help selden in his escape boots shirt cap it was all sir henry's the tragedy was still black enough but this man had at least deserved death by the laws of his country i told holmes how the matter stood my heart bubbling over with thankfulness and joy then the clothes have been the poor devil's death said he it is clear enough that the hound has been laid on from some article of sir henry's the boot which was abstracted in the hotel in all probability and so ran this man down there is one very singular thing however how came selden in the darkness to know that the hound was on his trail oh, he, he heard him to hear a hound upon the moor would not work a hard man like this convict into such a paroxysm of terror that he would risk recapture by screaming wildly for help by his cries he must have run a long way after he knew the animal was on his track how did he know a greater mystery to me is why this hound presuming that all our conjectures are correct i presume nothing well then why this hound should be loose to-night i suppose that it does not always run loose upon the moor stapleton would not let it go unless he had reason to think that sir henry would be there my difficulty is the more formidable of the two for i think that we shall very shortly get an explanation of yours while mine may remain forever a mystery the question now is what shall we do with this poor wretch's body we cannot leave it here to the foxes and the ravens i suggest that we put it in one of the huts until we can communicate with the police exactly i have no doubt that you and i can carry it so far hello watson what's this it's the man himself by all that's wonderful and audacious not a word to show your suspicions not a word or my plans crumble to the ground 
A figure was approaching us over the moor, and I saw the dull red glow of a cigar. The moon shone upon him, and I could distinguish the dapper shape and jaunty walk of the naturalist. He stopped when he saw us, and then came on again. "'Why, Dr. Watson, that's not you, is it? You are the last man that I should have expected to see out on the moor at this time of night. But, dear me, what's this? Somebody hurt? Not. Don't tell me that it is our friend, Sir Henry. He hurried past me and stooped over the dead man. I heard a sharp intake of his breath, and the cigar fell from his fingers. Who's this? he stammered. Uh, it is Selden, the man who escaped from Princetown. Dableton turned a ghastly face upon us, but by a supreme effort, he had overcome his amazement and his disappointment. He looked sharply from Holmes to me. Dear me! What a very shocking affair! How did he die? He appears to have broken his neck by falling over these rocks. My friend and I were strolling on the moor when we heard a cry. I heard a cry also. That was what brought me out. I was uneasy about Sir Henry. Why about Sir Henry, in particular? I could not help asking. Because I had suggested that he should come over. When he did not come, I was surprised, and I naturally became alarmed for his safety when I heard cries upon the moor. By the way, his eyes darted again from my face to Holmes, did you hear anything else besides a cry? No, said Holmes. Did you? No. What do you mean, then? Oh, you know the stories that the peasants tell about a phantom hound and so on. It is said to be heard at night upon the moor. I was wondering if there were any evidence of such a sound to-night. We heard nothing of the kind, said I. And uh, what is your theory about this poor fellow's death? I have no doubt that anxiety and exposure have driven him off his head. He has rushed about the moor in a crazy state, and eventually fallen over here and broken his neck. That seems to be the most reasonable theory, said Stapleton, and he gave a sigh which I took to indicate his relief. Well, what, do you, what do you think about it, Mr. Sherlock Holmes? My friend bowed his compliments. "'You are quick at identification,' said he. "'We have been expecting you in these parts since Dr. Watson came here. You are in time to see a tragedy.' "'Yes, indeed. I have no doubt that my friend's explanation will cover the facts. I will take an unpleasant remembrance back to London with me to-morrow. Oh, you return to-morrow? That is my intention. I hope your visit has cast some light upon these occurrences which have puzzled us." Holmes shrugged his shoulders. "'One cannot always have the success for which one hopes. An investigator needs facts, and not legends or rumors. It has not been a satisfactory case. My friend spoke in his frankest and most unconcerned manner. Stapleton still looked hard at him. Then he turned to me. I would suggest carrying this poor fellow to my house, but it would give my sister such a fright that I do not feel justified in doing it. I think that if we put something over his face, he will be safe until morning. And so it was arranged. Resisting Stapleton's offer of hospitality, Holmes and I set off to Baskerville Hall, leaving the naturalist to return alone. Looking back, we saw the figure moving slowly away over the broad moor, and behind him that one black smudge on the silvered slope which showed where the man was lying who had come so horribly to his end. End of chapter 12Chapter Thirteen of The Hound of the Baskervilles by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Bob Newfound. Chapter Thirteen Fixing the Nets. 
we're at close grips at last said holmes as we walked together across the moor what a nerve the fellow has how he pulled himself together in the face of what must have been a paralyzing shock when he found that the wrong man had fallen a victim to his plot i told you in london watson and i tell you now again that we have never had a foeman more worthy of our steel i am sorry that he has seen you and so was i at first but there was no getting out of it what effect do you think it will have upon his plans now that he knows you are here it may cause him to be more cautious or it may drive him to desperate measures at once like most clever criminals he may be too confident in his own cleverness and imagine that he has completely deceived us why should we not arrest him at once my dear watson you were born to be a man of action your instinct is always to do something energetic but supposing for argument's sake that we had arrested him to-night what on earth the better off should we be for that we could prove nothing against him. There's the devilish cunning of it. If he were acting through a human agent, we could get some evidence. But if we were to drag this great dog to the light of day, it would not help us in putting a rope round the neck of its master. Surely we have a case. Not a shadow of one. Only surmise and conjecture. We should be laughed out of court if we came with such a story and such evidence. Oh, there is Sir Charles's death, found dead without a mark upon him. You and I know that he died of sheer fright, and we know also what frightened him, but how are we to get twelve stolid jurymen to know it? What signs are there of a hound? Where are the marks of its fangs? Of course we know that a hound does not bite a dead body, and that Sir Charles was dead before ever the brute overtook him but we have to prove all this and we are not in a position to do it well then to-night we are not much better off to-night again there was no direct connection between the hound and the man's death we never saw the hound we heard it but we could not prove that it was running upon this man's trail there is complete absence of motive no my dear fellow we must reconcile ourselves to the fact that we have no case at present and that it is worth our while to run any risk in order to establish one and how do you propose to do so i have great hopes of what mrs laura lyons may do for us when the position of affairs is made clear to her and i have my own plan as well sufficient for to-morrow is the evil thereof but i hope before the day is past to have the upper hand at last i could draw nothing further from him and we walked lost in thought as far as the baskerville gates are you coming up yes i see no reason for further concealment but one last word watson say nothing of the hound to sir henry let him think that selden's death was as stapleton would have us believe he will have a better nerve for the ordeal which he will have to undergo to-morrow when he is engaged if i remember your report right to dine with these people and so am i then you must excuse yourself and he must go alone that will be easily arranged and now if we are too late for dinner i think that we are both ready for our suppers sir henry was more pleased than surprised to see sherlock holmes for he had for some days been expecting that recent events would bring him down from london he did raise his eyebrows however when he found that my friend had neither any luggage nor any explanations for its absence between us we soon supplied his wants and then over a belated supper we explained to the baronet as much of our experience as it seemed desirable that he should know but first i had the unpleasant duty of breaking the news to barrymore and his wife to him it may have been an unmitigated relief but she wept bitterly in her apron to all the world he was a man of violence half animal and half demon but to her he always remained the little wilful boy of her own girlhood 
the child who had clung to her hand. Evil indeed is the man who has not one woman to mourn him. "'I've been moping in the house all day since Watson went off in the morning,' said the baronet. "'I guess I should have some credit, for I have kept my promise. If I hadn't sworn not to go out alone, I might have had a more lively evening, for I had a message from Stapleton asking me over there. I have no doubt that you would have had a more lively evening, said Holmes dryly. By the way, I don't suppose you appreciate that we have been mourning over you as having broken your neck. Sir Henry opened his eyes. How was that? The poor wretch was dressed in your clothes. I fear your servant who gave them to him may get into trouble with the police. That is unlikely. There was no mark on any of them, as far as I know. That's lucky for him. In fact, it's lucky for all of you, since you are all on the wrong side of the law in this matter. I am not sure that as a conscientious detective my first duty is not to arrest the whole household. Watson's reports are most incriminating documents. But how about the case? asked the baronet. Have you made anything out of the tangle? I don't know that Watson and I are much wiser since we came down. I think that I shall be in a position to make the situation rather more clear to you before long. It has been an exceedingly difficult and most complicated business. There are several points upon which we still want light, but it is coming all the same. We've had one experience, as Watson has no doubt told you. We heard the hound on the moor, so I can swear that it is not all empty superstition. I had something to do with dogs when I was out west, and I know one when I hear one. If you can muzzle that one and put him on a chain, I'll be ready to swear you are the greatest detective of all time. I think I will muzzle him and chain him all right if you will give me your help. Whatever you tell me to do, I will do. Very good. And I will ask you also to do it blindly, without always asking the reason. Just as you like. If you will do this, I think the chances are that our little problem will soon be solved. I have no doubt. He stopped suddenly, and stared fixedly up over my head into the air. The lamp beat upon his face, and so intent was it, and so still that it might have been that of a clear-cut classical statue, a personification of alertness and expectation. "'What is it?' we both cried. I could see as he looked down that he was repressing some internal emotion. His features were still composed, but his eyes shone with amused exultation. "'Excuse the admiration of a connoisseur,' said he, as he waved his hand towards the line of portraits which covered the opposite wall. Watson won't allow that I know anything of art, but that is mere jealousy, because our views upon the subject differ. Now these are a really very fine series of portraits. Well, I'm glad to hear you say so, said Sir Henry, glancing with some surprise at my friend. I don't pretend to know much about these things, and I'd be a better judge of a horse or a steer than a picture. I didn't know that you found time for such things. I know what is good when I see it, and I see it now. That's a Neller, I'll swear, that lady in the blue silk over yonder, and the stout gentleman with the wig ought to be a Reynolds. They are family portraits, I presume? Every one. Do you know the names? Barrymore has been coaching me in them, and I think I can say my lessons fairly well. Who is the gentleman with the telescope? That is Rear Admiral Baskerville, who served under Rodney in the West Indies. The man with the blue coat and the roll of paper is Sir William Baskerville, who was chairman of committees of the House of Commons under Pitt. And this cavalier opposite to me, the one with the black velvet and the lace. Ah, you have a right to know about him. That is the cause of all the mischief, the wicked Hugo, who started the hound of the Baskervilles. We're not likely to forget him. 
I gazed with interest and some surprise upon the portrait. "'Dear me,' said Holmes, "'he seems a quiet, meek-mattered man enough, but I dare say that there was a lurking devil in his eyes. I had pictured him as a more robust and ruffianly person. Well, there's no doubt about the authenticity, for the name and the date, 1647, are on the back of the canvas. Holmes said little more, but the picture of the old roisterer seemed to have a fascination for him, and his eyes were continually fixed upon it during supper. It was not until later, when Sir Henry had gone to his room, that I was able to follow the trend of his thoughts. He led me back into the banqueting hall, his bedroom candle in his hand, and he held it up against the time-stained portrait on the wall. Do you see anything there? I looked at the broad-plumed hat, the curling love-locks, the white lace collar, and the straight, severe face which was framed between them. It was not a brutal countenance, but it was prim, hard, and stern, with a firm-set, thin-lipped mouth and a coldly intolerant eye. Is it like any one you know? Well, there is something of Sir Henry about the jaw. Just a suggestion, perhaps. But wait an instant. He stood upon a chair, and holding up the light in his left hand, he curved his right arm over the broad hat and round the long ringlet. Good heavens! I cried in amazement. The face of Stapleton had sprung out of the canvas. Ah, you see it now. My eyes have been trained to examine faces, but not their trimmings. It is the first quality of a criminal investigator that he should see through a disguise. But this is marvellous. It might be his portrait. Yes, it is an interesting instance of a throwback, which appears to be both physical and spiritual. A study of family portraits is enough to convert a man to the doctrine of reincarnation. The fellow is a Baskerville, that is evident, with designs upon the succession. Exactly. This chance of the picture has supplied us with one of our most obvious missing links. We have him, Watson, we have him, and I dare swear that before tomorrow night he will be fluttering in our net as helpless as one of his own butterflies. A pin, a cork, and a card, and we add him to the Baker Street collection. He burst into one of his rare fits of laughter as he turned away from the picture. I have not heard him laugh often, and it has always boded ill to somebody. I was up betimes in the morning, but Holmes was a foot earlier still, for I saw him as I dressed coming up the drive. "'Yes, we should have a full day to-day,' he remarked, and he rubbed his hands with the joy of action. "'The nets are all in place, and the drag is about to begin. We'll know before the day is out whether we have caught our big, lean-jawed pike, or whether he has got through the meshes. Have you been on the moor already?' I have sent a report from Grimpen to Princetown as to the death of Selden. I think I can promise that none of you will be troubled in the matter. And I have also communicated with my faithful Cartwright, who would certainly have pined away at the door of my heart, as a dog does at his master's grave, if I had not set his mind at rest about my safety. Oh, what is the next move? To see Sir Henry. Ah, here he is. "'Good morning, Holmes,' said the baronet. "'You look like a general who is planning a battle with his chief of staff.' "'That is the exact situation.' Watson was asking for orders. "'And so do I.' "'Very good. You are engaged, as I understand, to dine with our friends the Stapletons tonight. I hope that you will come also. They are very hospitable people.' and I am sure that they would be very glad to see you. I fear that Watson and I must go to London. To London? Yes, I think that we shall be more useful there at the present juncture. The baronet's face perceptibly lengthened. I hope that you are going to see me through this business. 
the hall and the moor are not very pleasant places when one is alone my dear fellow you must trust me implicitly and do exactly what i tell you you can tell your friends that we should have been happy to come with you but that urgent business required us to be in town we hope very soon to return to devonshire will you remember to give them that message if you insist upon it there is no alternative i assure you i saw by the baronet's clouded brow that he was deeply hurt by what he regarded as our desertion when do you desire to go he asked coldly immediately after breakfast we will drive into coombe tracy but watson will leave his things as a pledge that he will come back to you watson you will send a note to stable them to tell them that you regret that you cannot come i have a good mind to go to london with you said the baronet why should i stay here alone because it is your post of duty because you gave me your word that you would do as you were told and i tell you to stay all right then i'll stay one more direction i wish you to drive to merripit house send back your trap however and let them know that you intend to walk home to walk across the moor yes but that is the very thing which you have so often cautioned me not to do this time you may do it with safety if i had not every confidence in your nerve and courage i would not suggest it but it is essential that you should do it then i will do it and as you value your life do not crow across the moor in any direction save along the straight path which leads from merripit house to the grimpen road and is your natural way home i will do just what you say very good i should be glad to get away as soon after breakfast as possible so as to reach london in the afternoon i was much astounded by this programme though i remember that holmes had said to stapleton on the night before that his visit would terminate next day it had not crossed my mind however that he would wish me to go with him nor could i understand how we could both be absent at a moment which he himself declared to be critical there was nothing for it however but implicit obedience so we bade good-bye to our rueful friend and a couple of hours afterwards we were at the station of coombe tracy and had dispatched the trap upon its return journey a small boy was waiting upon the platform any orders sir you will take this train to town cartwright the moment you arrive you will send a wire to sir henry baskerville in my name to say that if he finds the pocket-book which i have dropped he is to send it by registered post to baker street yes sir and ask at the station office if there is a message for me the boy returned with a telegram which holmes handed to me it ran wire received coming down with unsigned warrant arrive five thirty lestrade that is an answer to mine of this morning he is the best of the professionals i think and we may need his assistance right, now watson i think that we cannot employ our time better than by calling upon your acquaintance mrs laura lyon his plan of campaign was beginning to be evident he would use the baronet in order to convince the stapletons that we were really gone while we would actually return at the instant when we were likely to be needed that telegram from london if mentioned by sir henry to the stapletons must remove the last suspicions from their minds already i seemed to see our nets drawing closer around that lean-jawed pike mrs laura lyons was in her office and sherlock holmes opened his interview with a frankness and directness which considerably amazed her i am investigating the circumstances which attended the death of the late sir charles baskerville said he my friend here dr watson has informed me of what you have communicated and also of what you have withheld in connection with that matter what have i withheld she asked defiantly you have confessed that you asked sir charles to be at the gate at ten o'clock 
we know that that was the place and hour of his death you have withheld what the connection is between these events there is no connection in that case the coincidence must indeed be an extraordinary one but i think that we shall succeed in establishing a connection after all i wish to be perfectly frank with you mrs lyons we regard this case as one of murder and the evidence may implicate not only your friend mr stapleton but his wife as well the lady sprang from her chair his wife she cried the fact is no longer a secret the person who has passed for his sister is really his wife mrs lyons had resumed her seat her hands were grasping the arms of her chair and i saw that the pink nails had turned white with the pressure of her grip his wife she said again his wife he is not a married man sherlock holmes shrugged his shoulders prove it to me prove it to me if you can do so the fierce flash of her eyes said more than any words i have come prepared to do so said holmes drawing several papers from his pocket here is a photograph of the couple taken in york four years ago it is endorsed mr and mrs vandeleur but you will have no difficulty in recognizing him and her also if you know her by sight here are three written descriptions by trustworthy witnesses of mr and mrs vandeleur who at that time kept sir oliver's private school read them and see if you can doubt the identity of these people she glanced at them and then looked up at us with the set rigid face of a desperate woman mr holmes she said this man had offered me marriage on condition that i could get a divorce from my husband he has lied to me the villain in every conceivable way not one word of truth has he ever told me and why why i imagined that all was for my own sake but now i see that i was never anything but a tool in his hands why should i preserve faith with him who never kept any with me why should i try to shield him from the consequences of his own wicked acts ask me what you like and there is nothing which i shall hold back one thing i swear to you and that is that when i wrote the letter i never dreamed of any harm to the old gentleman who had been my kindest friend i entirely believe you madam said sherlock holmes the recital of these events must be very painful to you and perhaps it will make it easier if i tell you what occurred and you can check me if i make any material mistake the sending of this letter was suggested to you by stapleton he dictated it i presume that the reason he gave was that you would receive help from sir charles for the legal expenses connected with your divorce exactly and then after you had sent the letter he dissuaded you from keeping the appointment he told me that it would hurt his self-respect that any other man should find the money for such an object and that though he was a poor man himself he would devote his last penny to removing the obstacles which divided us he appears to be a very consistent character and then you heard nothing until you read the reports of the death in the paper no and he made you swear to say nothing about your appointment with sir charles he did he said that the death was a very mysterious one and that i should certainly be suspected if the facts came out he frightened me into remaining silent quite so but you had your suspicions she hesitated and looked down i knew him she said but if he had kept faith with me i should always have done so with him i think that on the whole you've had a fortunate escape said sherlock holmes you have had him in your power and he knew it and yet you are alive you have been walking for some months very near to the edge of a precipice 
we must wish you good morning now mrs lyons and it is probable that you will very shortly hear from us again our case becomes rounded off and difficulty after difficulty thins away in front of us said holmes as we stood waiting for the arrival of the express from town i shall soon be in the position of being able to put into a single connected narrative one of the most singular and sensational crimes of modern times students of criminology will remember the analogous incidents of godno in little russia in the year sixty six and of course there are the anderson murders in north carolina but this case possesses some features which are entirely its own even now we have no clear case against this very wily man but i shall be very much surprised if it is not clear enough before we go to bed this night the london express came roaring into the station and a small wiry bulldog of a man had sprung from a first-class carriage we all three shook hands and i saw at once from the reverential way in which lestrade gazed at my companion that he had learned a good deal since the days when they had first worked together i could well remember the scorn which the theories of the reasoner used then to excite in the practical man anything good he asked the biggest thing for years said holmes we have two hours before we need think of starting i think we might employ it in getting some dinner and then lestrade we will take the London fog out of your throat by giving you a breath of the pure night air of Dartmoor. Never been there? Ah, well, I don't suppose you will forget your first visit. End of chapter 13this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Bob Neufeld. Chapter Fourteen: The Hound of the Baskervilles. One of Sherlock Holmes's defects, if indeed one may call it a defect, was that he was exceedingly loath to communicate his full plans to any other person until the instant of their fulfilment partly it came no doubt from his own masterful nature which loved to dominate and surprise those who were around him partly also from his professional caution which urged him never to take any chances the result however was very trying for those who were acting as his agents and assistants i had often suffered under it but never more so than during that long drive in the darkness the great ordeal was in front of us at last we were about to make our final effort and yet holmes had said nothing and i could only surmise what his course of action would be my nerves thrilled with anticipation when at last the cold wind upon our faces and the dark void spaces on either side of the narrow road told me that we were back upon the moor once again every stride of the horses and every turn of the wheels was taking us nearer to our supreme adventure. Our conversation was hampered by the presence of the driver of the hired wagonette, so that we were forced to talk of trivial matters when our nerves were tense with emotion and anticipation. It was a relief to me, after that unnatural restraint, when we at last passed Franklin's house, and knew that we were drawing near to the hall and to the scene of action. We did not drive up to the door, but got down near the gate of the avenue. The wagonette was paid off and ordered to return to Coombe Tracy, forthwith, while we started to walk to Merripit House. "'Are you armed, Lestrade?' the little detective smiled as long as i have my trousers i have a hip pocket and as long as i have my hip pocket i have something in it good my friend and i are also ready for emergencies you're mighty close about this affair mr holmes what's the game now a waiting game my word it does not seem a very cheerful place 
said the detective with a shiver, glancing round him at the gloomy slopes of the hill and at the large lake of fog which lay over the Grimpen Mire. I see the lights of a house ahead of us. That is Merripit House, and the end of our journey. I must request you to walk on tiptoe, and not to talk above a whisper. We moved cautiously along the track as if we were bound for the house, but Holmes halted us when we were about two hundred yards from it. This will do, said he. These rocks upon the right make an admirable screen. We are to wait here? Yes, we shall make our little ambush here. Get into this hollow, Lestrade. You have been inside the house, have you not, Watson? Can you tell the position of the rooms? What are these latticed windows at this end? I think they are the kitchen windows. And the one beyond, which shines so brightly. Well, that is certainly the dining-room. The blinds are up. You know the lie of the land best. Creep forward quietly and see what they are doing. But for heaven's sake, don't let them know that they are watched. I tiptoed down the path and stooped behind the low wall which surrounded the stunted orchard. Creeping in its shadow, I reached a point whence I could look straight through the uncurtained window. There were only two men in the room, Sir Henry and Stapleton. They sat with their profiles towards me on either side of the round table. Both of them were smoking cigars, and coffee and wine were in front of them. Stapleton was talking with animation, but the baronet looked pale and distrait. Perhaps the thought of that lonely walk across the ill-omened moor was weighing heavily upon his mind. As I watched them, Stapleton rose and left the room, while Sir Henry filled his glass again and leaned back in his chair, puffing at his cigar. I heard the creak of a door and the crisp sound of boots upon gravel. The steps passed along the path on the other side of the wall under which I crouched. Looking over, I saw the naturalist pause at the door of an outhouse in the corner of the orchard. A key turned in a lock, and as he passed in there was a curious scuffling noise from within. He was only a minute or so inside, and then I heard the key turn once more, and he passed me and re-entered the house. I saw him rejoin his guest and I crept quietly back to where my companions were waiting to tell them what I had seen. "'You say, Watson, that the lady is not there?' Holmes asked when I had finished my report. "'No.' "'Where can she be, then, since there is no light in any other room except the kitchen?' "'I cannot think where she is.' I have said that over the great Grimpen Mire there hung a dense white fog. It was drifting slowly in our direction, and banked itself up like a wall on that side of us, low but thick and well defined. The moon shone on it, and it looked like a great glimmering ice field, with the heads of the distant tors as rocks borne upon its surface. Holmes's face was turned towards it and he muttered impatiently as he watched its sluggish drift. "'It's moving toward us, Watson. Is that serious? Very serious indeed, the one thing upon earth which could have disarranged my plans. It can't be very long now. It is already ten o'clock. Our success, and even his life, may depend upon his coming out before the fog is over the path.' The night was clear and fine above us. The stars shone cold and bright, while a half-moon bathed the whole scene in a soft, uncertain light. Before us lay the dark bulk of the house, its serrated roof and bristling chimneys hard outlined against the silver-spangled sky. Broad bars of golden light from the lower windows stretched across the orchard and the moor. One of them was suddenly shut off. The servants had left the kitchen. There only remained the lamp in the dining-room, where the two men, the murderous host and the unconscious guest, still chatted over their cigars. 
every minute that white woolly plain which covered one half of the moor was drifting closer and closer to the house. Already the first thin wisps of it were curling across the golden square of the lighted window. The farther wall of the orchard was already invisible, and the trees were standing out of a swirl of white vapour. As we watched it, the fog wreaths came crawling round both corners of the house, and rolled slowly into one dense bank, on which the upper floor and the roof floated like a strange ship upon a shadowy sea. Holmes struck his hand passionately upon the rock in front of us, and stamped his feet in his impatience. "'If he isn't out in a quarter of an hour, the path will be covered. In half an hour we won't be able to see our hands in front of us. Shall we move farther back upon higher ground? Yes, I think it would be as well.' So, as the fog-bank flowed onward, we fell back before it, until we were half a mile from the house, and still that dense white sea, with the moon silvering its upper edge, swept slowly and inexorably on. "'We are going too far,' said Holmes. "'We dare not take the chance of his being overtaken before he can reach us. At all costs we must hold our ground where we are.' He dropped on his knees and clapped his ear to the ground. "'Thank God! I can hear him coming!' A sound of quick steps broke the silence of the moor. Crouching among the stones, we stared intently at the silver-tipped bank in front of us. The steps grew louder, and through the fog, as through a curtain, there stepped the man whom we were awaiting. He looked round him in surprise as we emerged into the clear starlit night. Then he came swiftly along the path, passed close to where we lay, and went up the long slope behind us. As he walked he glanced continually over either shoulder, like a man who is ill at ease. St hist cried Holmes, and I heard the sharp click of a cocking pistol. Look out! It's coming! There was a thin, crisp, continuous patter from somewhere in the heart of that crawling bank. The cloud was within fifty yards of where we lay, and we glared at it, all three, uncertain what horror was about to break from the heart of it. I was at Holmes's elbow, and I glanced for an instant at his face. He was pale and exultant, his eyes shining brightly in the moonlight. But suddenly, they started forward in a rigid fixed stare, and his lips parted in amazement. At the same instant Lestrade gave a yell of terror, and threw himself face downward upon the ground. I sprang to my feet, my inert hand grasping my pistol, my mind paralyzed by the dreadful shape which had sprung out upon us from the shadows of the fog. A hound it was an enormous coal-black hound, but not such a hound as mortal eyes have ever seen. Fire burst from its open mouth, its eyes glowed with a smouldering glare, its muzzle and hackles and dewlap were outlined in flickering flame. Never in the delirious dream of a disordered brain could anything more savage, more appalling, more hellish be conceived than that dark form and savage face which broke upon us out of the wall of fog. With long bounds the huge black creature was leaping down the track, following hard upon the footsteps of our friend. So paralyzed were we by the apparition that we allowed him to pass before we had recovered our nerve. Then Holmes and I both fired together, and the creature gave a hideous howl, which showed that one at least had hit him. He did not pause, however, but bounded onward. Far away on the path we saw Sir Henry looking back, his face white in the moonlight, his hands raised in horror, glaring helplessly at the frightful thing which was hunting him down. But that cry of pain from the hound had blown all our fears to the winds. If he was vulnerable, he was mortal, 
and if we could wound him, we could kill him. Never have I seen a man run as Holmes ran that night. I am reckoned fleet of foot, but he outpaced me as much as I outpaced the little professional. In front of us, as we flew up the track, we heard scream after scream from Sir Henry, and the deep roar of the hound. I was in time to see the beast spring upon its victim, hurl him to the ground, and worry at his throat. But the next instant Holmes had emptied five barrels of his revolver into the creature's flank. With a last howl of agony and a vicious snap in the air, it rolled upon its back, four feet pawing furiously, and then fell limp upon its side. I stooped, panting, and pressed my pistol to the dreadful shimmering head, but it was useless to press the trigger. The giant hound was dead. Sir Henry lay insensible where he had fallen. We tore away his collar, and Holmes breathed a prayer of gratitude when we saw that there was no sign of a wound, and that the rescue had been in time. Already our friend's eyelids shivered, and he made a feeble effort to move. Lestrade thrust his brandy flask between the baronet's teeth, and two frightened eyes were looking up at us. "'My God!' he whispered. "'What was it? What in heaven's name was it?' "'It's dead, whatever it is,' said Holmes. "'We've laid the family ghost once and forever.' In mere size and strength it was a terrible creature which was lying stretched before us. It was not a pure bloodhound, and it was not a pure mastiff, but it appeared to be a combination of the two, gaunt, savage, and as large as a small lioness. Even now, in the stillness of death, the huge jaws seemed to be dripping with a bluish flame, and the small, deep-set, cruel eyes were ringed with fire. I placed my hand upon the glowing muzzle and as I held them up, my own fingers smouldered and gleamed in the darkness. Phosphorus, I said. A cunning preparation of it, said Holmes, sniffing at the dead animal. There is no smell which might have interfered with his power of scent. We owe you a deep apology, Sir Henry, for having exposed you to this fright. I was prepared for a hound, but not for such a creature as this, and the fog gave us little time to receive him. You saved my life. Having first endangered it, are you strong enough to stand? Oh, give me another mouthful of that brandy, and I shall be ready for anything. So, now, if you will help me up, what do you propose to do? to leave you here. You are not fit for further adventures to-night. If you will wait, one or other of us will go back with you to the hall." He tried to stagger to his feet, but he was still ghastly pale and trembling in every limb. We helped him to a rock where he sat shivering with his face buried in his hands. "'We must leave you now,' said Holmes. The rest of our work must be done, and every moment is of importance. We have our case, and now we only want our man. It's a thousand to one against our finding him at the house," he continued as he retraced our steps swiftly down the path. Those shots must have told him that the game was up. We were some distance off, and the fog may have deadened him. He followed the hound to call him off. Of that you may be certain. No, no, he is gone by this time, but we'll search the house and make sure." The front door was open, so we rushed in and hurried from room to room, to the amazement of a doddering old manservant who met us in the passage. There was no light save in the dining-room, but Holmes caught up the lamp and left no corner of the house unexplored. No sign could we see of the man whom we were chasing. On the upper floor, however, 
one of the bedroom doors was locked. "'There's some one in here,' cried Lestrade. "'I can hear a movement. Open this door!' A faint moaning and rustling came from within. Holmes struck the door just over the lock with the flat of his foot, and it flew open. Pistol in hand, we all rushed into the room. But there was no sign within it of that desperate and defiant villain whom we expected to see. Instead, we were faced by an object so strange and so unexpected that we stood for a moment staring at it in amazement. The room had been fashioned into a small museum, and the walls were lined by a number of glass-top cases full of that collection of butterflies and moths, the formation of which had been the relaxation of this complex and dangerous man. In the centre of this room there was an upright beam, which had been placed at some period as a support for the old worm-eaten bulk of timber which spanned the roof. To this post a figure was tied, so swathed and muffled in the sheets which had been used to secure it, that one could not for the moment tell whether it was that of a man or a woman. One towel passed round the throat and was secured at the back of the pillar. Another covered the lower part of the face, and over it two dark eyes, eyes full of grief and shame and a dreadful questioning, stared back at us. In a minute we had torn off the gag, unswathed the bonds, and Mrs. Stapleton sank upon the floor in front of us. As her beautiful head fell upon her chest, I saw the clear red wheel of a whiplash across her neck. "'The brute!' cried Holmes. "'Here, Lestrade, your brandy bottle. Put her in the chair. She has fainted from ill usage and exhaustion.' She opened her eyes again. "'Is he safe?' she asked. "'Has he escaped?' "'He cannot escape us, madam.' "'No, no, I do not mean my husband. Sir Henry, is he safe?' "'Yes. And the hound?' "'It is dead.' She gave a long sigh of satisfaction. Thank God! Thank God! Oh, this villain! See how he has treated me!" She shot her arms out from her sleeves, and we saw with horror that they were all mottled with bruises. But this is nothing, nothing! It is my mind and soul that he has tortured and defiled. I could endure it all, ill-usage, solitude, a life of deception, everything, as long as I could still cling to the hope that I had his love. But now I know that in this also I have been his dupe and his tool." She broke into passionate sobbing as she spoke. "'You bear him no good will, madam,' said Holmes. Tell us, then, where we shall find him. If you have ever aided him in evil, help us now, and so atone. There is but one place where he can have fled, she answered. There is an old tin mine on an island in the heart of the mire. It was there that he kept his hound, and there also he had made preparations so that he might have a refuge. That is where he would fly. The fog-bank lay like white wool against the window. Holmes held the lamp towards it. "'See,' said he, "'no one can find his way into Grimpen Mire to-night.' She laughed and clapped her hands. Her eyes and teeth gleamed with fierce merriment. "'He may find his way in, but never out,' she cried. "'How can he see the guiding wands to-night? We planted them together he and I, to mark the pathway through the mire. Oh, if I could only have plucked them out to-day! Then, indeed, you would have had him at your mercy." It was evident to us that all pursuit was in vain until the fog had lifted. 
Meanwhile, we left Lestrade in possession of the house, while Holmes and I went back with the baronet to Baskerville Hall. The story of the Stapletons could no longer be withheld from him, but he took the blow bravely when he learned the truth about the woman whom he had loved. But the shock of the night's adventures had shattered his nerves, and before morning he lay delirious in a high fever under the care of Dr. Mortimer. The two of them were destined to travel together round the world before Sir Henry had become once more the hale, hearty man that he had been before he became master of that ill-omened estate. And now I come rapidly to the conclusion of this singular narrative, in which I have tried to make the reader share those dark fears and vague surmises which clouded our lives so long and ended in so tragic a manner. On the morning after the death of the hound the fog had lifted, and we were guided by Mrs. Stapleton to the point where they had found a pathway through the bog. It helped us to realize the horror of this woman's life when we saw the eagerness and joy with which she laid us on her husband's track. We left her standing upon the thin peninsula of firm peaty soil, which tapered out into the widespread bog. From the end of it a small wand planted here and there showed where the path zigzagged from tuft to tuft of rushes among those green scummed pits and foul quagmires which barred the way to the stranger. Rank reeds and lush slimy water-plants sent an odour of decay and a heavy miasmatic vapour onto our faces, while a false step plunged us more than once thigh-deep into the dark quivering mire, which shook for yards in soft undulations under our feet. Its tenacious grip plucked at our heels as we walked, and when we sank into it it was as if some malignant hand was tugging us down into those obscene depths, so grim and purposeful was the clutch in which it held us. Once only we saw a trace that someone had passed that perilous way before us. From amid a tuft of cotton grass which bore it up out of the slime, some dark thing was projecting. Holmes sang to his waist as he stepped from the path to seize it, and had we not been there to drag him out, he would never have set his foot upon firm dry land again. He held an old black boot in the air. Myers Toronto was printed on the leather inside. "'It is worth a mud-bath,' said he. "'It is our friend Sir Henry's missing boot, thrown there by Stapleton in his flight.' Exactly. He retained it in his hand after using it to set the hound upon the track. He fled when he knew the game was up, still clutching it, and he hurled it away at this point of his flight. We know at least that he came so far in safety. But more than that we were never destined to know, though there was much which we might surmise. There was no chance of finding footsteps in the mire for the rising mud oozed swiftly in upon them, but as we at last reached firmer ground beyond the morass we all looked eagerly for them, but no slightest sign of them ever met our eyes. If the earth told a true story, then Stapleton never reached that island of refuge towards which he struggled through the fog upon that last night. Somewhere in the heart of the great Grimpen mire down in the foul slime of the huge morass which had sucked him in, this cold and cruel-hearted man is forever buried. Many traces we found of him in the bog-girt island where he had hid his savage ally. A huge driving-wheel and a shaft half-filled with rubbish showed the position of an abandoned mine. Beside it were the crumbling remains of the cottages of the miners, driven away, no doubt, by the foul reek of the surrounding swamp. In one of these a staple and chain with a quantity of gnawed bones showed where the animal had been confined. A skeleton, with a tangle of brown hair adhering to it, lay among the debris. "'A dog,' said Holmes. "'By Jove, a curly-haired spaniel! Poor Mortimer will never see his pet again.' 
well i do not know that this place contains any secret which we have not already fathomed he could hide his hound but he could not hush its voice and hence came those cries which even in daylight were not pleasant to hear on an emergency he could keep the hound in the outhouse at Maripet, but it was always a risk and it was only on the supreme day which he regarded as the end of all his efforts that he dared do it this paste in the tin is no doubt the luminous mixture with which the creature was daubed it was suggested of course by the story of the family hellhound and by the desire to frighten old sir charles to death no wonder the poor devil of a convict ran and screamed even as our friend did and as we ourselves might have done when he saw such a creature bounding through the darkness of the moor upon his track it was a cunning device for apart from the chance of driving a victim to his death what peasant should venture to inquire too closely into such a creature should he get sight of it as many have done upon the moor i said it in london watson and i say it again now that never yet have we helped to hunt down a more dangerous man than he who is lying yonder he swept his long arm towards the huge mottled expanse of green splotched bog which stretched away until it merged into the russet slopes of the moor end of chapter fourteen Chapter Fifteen of *The Hound of the Baskervilles* by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Bob Neufeld. Chapter Fifteen, A Retrospection. It was the end of November, and Holmes and I sat upon a raw and foggy night on either side of a blazing fire in our sitting room in Baker Street. Since the tragic upshot of our visit to Devonshire, he had engaged in two affairs of the utmost importance, in the first of which he had exposed the atrocious conduct of Colonel Upwood in connection with the famous card scandal of the Non Pareil Club, while in the second he had defended the unfortunate Madame Montpensier from the charge of murder which hung over her in connection with the death of her stepdaughter, Mademoiselle Carrère the young lady who as it will be remembered was found six months later alive and married in new york my friend was in excellent spirits over the success which had attended a succession of difficult and important cases so that i was able to induce him to discuss the details of the baskerville mystery i had waited patiently for the opportunity for i was aware that he would never permit cases to overlap and that his clear and logical mind would not be drawn from its present work to dwell upon memories of the past. Sir Henry and Dr. Mortimer were, however, in London, on their way to that long voyage which had been recommended for the restoration of his shattered nerves. They had called upon us that very afternoon, so that it was natural that the subject should come up for discussion. "'The whole course of events,' said Holmes, "'from the point of view of the man who called himself Stapleton, was simple and direct, although to us, who had no means in the beginning of knowing the motives of his actions, and could only learn part of the facts, it all appeared exceedingly complex. I have had the advantage of two conversations with Mrs. Stapleton, and the case has now been so entirely cleared up that I am not aware that there is anything which has remained a secret to us. You will find a few notes upon the matter under the heading B in my indexed list of cases. Well, perhaps you would kindly give me a sketch of the course of events from memory oh, certainly though i cannot guarantee that i will carry all the facts in my mind intense mental concentration has a curious way of blotting out what has passed the barrister who has his case at his fingers ends and is able to argue with an expert upon his own subject finds that a week or two of the courts will drive it all out of his head once more so each of my cases displaces the last, and Mademoiselle Carrere has blurred my recollection of Baskerville Hall. Tomorrow some other little problem may be submitted to my notice, which will in turn dispossess the fair French lady and the infamous Upwood. 
So far as the case of the hound goes, however, I will give you the course of events as nearly as I can, and you will suggest anything which I may have forgotten. My inquiries show beyond all question that the family portrait did not lie, and that this fellow was indeed a Baskerville. He was a son of that Roger Baskerville, the younger brother of Sir Charles, who fled with a sinister reputation to South America, where he was said to have died unmarried. He did, as a matter of fact, marry, and had one child, this fellow, whose real name is the same as his father's. He married Beryl Garcia, one of the beauties of Costa Rica, and having purloined a considerable sum of public money, he changed his name to Vandeleur and fled to England, where he established a school in the east of Yorkshire. His reason for attempting this special line of business was that he had struck up an acquaintance with a consumptive tutor upon the voyage home, and that he had used this man's ability to make the undertaking a success. Fraser, the tutor, died, however, and the school, which had begun well, sank from disrepute into infamy. The Vandalers made it convenient to change their name to Stapleton, and he brought the remains of his fortune, his schemes for the future, and his taste for entomology to the south of England. I learned at the British Museum that he was a recognized authority upon the subject, and that the name of Vandeleur has been permanently attached to a certain moth, which he had, in his Yorkshire days, been the first to describe. We now come to that portion of his life which was proved to be of such intense interest to us. The fellow had evidently made inquiry, and found that only two lives intervened between him and a valuable estate. When he went to Devonshire his plans were, I believe, exceedingly hazy, but that he met mischief from the first is evident from the way in which he took his wife with him in the character of his sister. The idea of using her as a decoy was clearly already in his mind, though he may have not been certain how the details of his plot were to be arranged. He meant in the end to have the estate and he was ready to use any tool or run any risk for that end. His first act was to establish himself as near to his ancestral home as he could, and his second was to cultivate a friendship with Sir Charles Baskerville and with the neighbors. The baronet himself told him about the family hound, and so prepared the way for his own death. Stapleton, as I will continue to call him, knew that the old man's heart was weak, and that a shock would kill him. So much he had learned from Dr. Mortimer. He had heard also that Sir Charles was superstitious, and had taken this grim legend very seriously. His ingenious mind instantly suggested a way by which the baronet could be done to death, and yet it would be hardly possible to bring home the guilt to the real murderer. Having conceived the idea, he proceeded to carry it out with considerable finesse. An ordinary schemer would have been content to work with a savage hound. The use of artificial means to make the creature diabolical was a flash of genius upon his part. The dog he bought in London from Ross and Mangles, the dealers in Fulham Road. It was the strongest and most savage in their possession. He brought it down by the North Devon line and walked a great distance over the moor so as to get it home without exciting any remarks. He had already on his insect hunts learned to penetrate the Grimpen Mire, and so he found a safe hiding-place for the creature. Here he kenneled it and waited his chance. But it was some time in coming. The old gentleman could not be decoyed outside of his grounds at night. Several times Stapleton lurked about with his hound, but without avail. It was during these fruitless quests that he, or rather his ally, was seen by peasants, and that the legend of the demon dog received a new confirmation. He had hoped that his wife might lure Sir Charles to his ruin, but here she proved unexpectedly independent. She would not endeavor to entangle the old gentleman in a sentimental attachment which might deliver him over to his enemy. Threats, and even, I am sorry to say, 
blows refused to move her. She would have nothing to do with it, and for a time Stapleton was at a deadlock. He found a way out of his difficulties through the chance that Sir Charles, who had conceived a friendship for him, made him the minister of his charity in the case of this unfortunate woman, Mrs. Laura Lyons. By representing himself as a single man, he acquired complete influence over her, and he gave her to understand that in the event of her obtaining a divorce from her husband, he would marry her. His plans were suddenly brought to a head by his knowledge that Sir Charles was about to leave the hall on the advice of Dr. Mortimer, with whose opinion he himself pretended to coincide. He must act at once, or his victim might get beyond his power. He therefore put pressure upon Mrs. Lyons to write this letter, imploring the old man to give her an interview on the evening before his departure for London. He then, by a specious argument, prevented her from going, and so had the chance for which he had waited. Driving back in the evening from Coombe Tracy, he was in time to get his hound, to treat it with his infernal paint, and to bring the beast round to the gate, at which he had reason to expect that he would find the old gentleman waiting. The dog, incited by its master, sprang over the wicket gate and pursued the unfortunate baronet, who fled screaming down the yew alley. In that gloomy tunnel it must indeed have been a dreadful sight to see that huge black creature, with its flaming jaws and blazing eyes, bounding after its victim. He fell dead at the end of the alley from heart disease and terror. The hound had kept upon the grassy border while the baronet had run down the path, so that no track but the man's was visible. On seeing him lying still, the creature had probably approached to sniff at him, but finding him dead, had turned away again. It was then that it left the print which was actually observed by Dr. Mortimer. The hound was called off and hurried away to its lair in the Grimpen Mire, and a mystery was left which puzzled the authorities, alarmed the countryside, and finally brought the case within the scope of our observation. So much for the death of Sir Charles Baskerville. You perceive the devilish cunning of it, for really it would be almost impossible to make a case against the real murderer. His only accomplice was one who could never give him away, and the grotesque, inconceivable nature of the device only served to make it more effective. Both of the women concerned in the case, Mrs. Stapleton and Mrs. Laura Lyons, were left with a strong suspicion against Stapleton. Mrs. Stapleton knew that he had designs upon the old man, and also of the existence of the hound. Mrs. Lyons knew neither of these things, but had been impressed by the death occurring at the time of the uncancelled appointment, which was only known to him. However, both of them were under his influence, and he had nothing to fear from them. The first half of his task was successfully accomplished, but the more difficult still remained. It is possible that Stapleton did not know of the existence of an heir in Canada. In any case, he would very soon learn it from his friend Dr. Mortimer, and he was told by the latter all details about the arrival of Henry Baskerville. Stapleton's first idea was that this young stranger from Canada might possibly be done to death in London without coming down to Devonshire at all. He distrusted his wife ever since she had refused to help him in laying a trap for the old man, and he dared not leave her long out of his sight for fear he should lose his influence over her. It was for this reason that he took her to London with him. They lodged, I find, at the Mexborough Private Hotel in Craven Street, which was actually one of those called upon by my agent in search of evidence. Here he kept his wife imprisoned in her room while he, disguised in a beard, followed Dr. Mortimer to Baker Street, and afterwards to the station and to the Northumberland Hotel. His wife had some inkling of his plans, but she had such a fear of her husband, a fear founded upon brutal ill-treatment, that she dare not write to warn the man whom she knew to be in danger. If the letter should fall into Stapleton's hands, her own life would not be safe. 
Eventually, as we know, she adopted the expedient of cutting out the words which would form the message, and addressing the letter in a disguised hand. It reached the baronet, and gave him the first warning of his danger. It is very essential for Stapleton to get some article of Sir Henry's attire, so that, in case he was driven to use the dog, he might always have the means of setting him upon his track. With characteristic promptness and audacity, he set about this at once, and we cannot doubt that the boots or chambermaid of the hotel was well bribed to help him in his design. By chance, however, the first boot which was procured for him was a new one, and therefore useless for his purpose. He then had it returned and obtained another, a most instructive incident, since it proved conclusively, to my mind, that we were dealing with a real hound, as no other supposition could explain this anxiety to obtain an old boot and this indifference to a new one. The more outré and grotesque an incident is, the more carefully it deserves to be examined, and the very point which appears to complicate a case is, when duly considered and scientifically handled, the one which is most likely to elucidate it. Then we had the visit from our friends next morning, shadowed always by Stapleton in the cab. From his knowledge of our rooms and of my appearance, as well as from his general conduct, I am inclined to think that Stapleton's career of crime has been by no means limited to this single Baskerville affair. It is suggestive that during the last three years there have been four considerable burglaries in the West Country, for none of which was any criminal ever arrested. The last of these, at Folkestone Court in May, was remarkable for the cold-blooded pistoling of the page, who surprised the masked and solitary burglar. I cannot doubt that Stapleton recruited his waning resources in this fashion, and that for years he has been a desperate and dangerous man. We had an example of his readiness of resource that morning when he got away from us so successfully, and also of his audacity in sending back my own name to me through the cabman. From that moment he understood that I had taken over the case in London and that therefore there was no chance for him there, he returned to Dartmoor and awaited the arrival of the baronet. "'One moment,' said I. "'You have no doubt described the sequence of events correctly, but there is one point which you have left unexplained. What became of the hound when its master was in London?' "'I have given some attention to this matter, and it is undoubtedly of importance.' There can be no question that Stapleton had a confidant, though it is unlikely that he ever placed himself in his power by sharing all his plans with him. There was an old manservant at Merripit House whose name was Anthony. His connection with the Stapletons can be traced for several years, as far back as the schoolmastering days, so that he must have been aware that his master and mistress were really husband and wife. This man has disappeared and has escaped from the country. It is suggestive that Anthony is not a common name in England, while Antonio is so in all Spanish or Spanish-American countries. The man, like Mrs. Stapleton herself, spoke good English, but with a curious lisping accent. I have myself seen this old man cross the Grimpen Mire by the path which Stapleton had marked out. It is very probable, therefore, that in the absence of his master it was he who cared for the hound, though he may never have known the purpose for which the beast was used. The Stapletons then went down to Devonshire, where they were soon followed by Sir Henry and you. One word now as to how I stood myself at that time. It may possibly recur to your memory that, when I examined the paper upon which the printed words were fastened, I made a close inspection of the watermark. In doing so, I held it within a few inches of my eyes, and was conscious of a faint smell of the scent known as white jessamine. There are seventy-five perfumes which it is very necessary that a criminal expert should be able to distinguish from each other, and cases have more than once, within my own experience, depended upon their prompt recognition. The scent suggested the presence of a lady 
and already my thoughts began to turn towards the Stapletons. Thus I had made certain of the hound, and had guessed at the criminal before we ever went to the West Country. It was my game to watch Stapleton. It was evident, however, that I could not do this if I were with you, since he would be keenly on his guard. I deceived everybody, therefore, yourself included, and I came down secretly when I was supposed to be in London. My hardships were not so great as you imagined, though some trifling details must never interfere with the investigation of a case. I stayed for the most part at Coombe Tracy, and only used the hut upon the moor when it was necessary to be near the scene of action. Cartwright had come down with me, and in his disguise as a country boy he was of great assistance to me. I was dependent upon him for food and clean linen. When I was watching Stapleton, Cartwright was frequently watching you, so that I was able to keep my hand upon all the strings. I have already told you that your reports reached me rapidly, being forwarded instantly from Baker Street to Coombe Tracy. They were of great service to me, and especially that one incidentally truthful piece of biography of Stapleton's. I was able to establish the identity of the man and the woman, and knew at last exactly how I stood. The case had been considerably complicated through the incident of the escaped convict, and the relations between him and the Barrymores. This also you cleared up in a very effective way, though I had already come to the same conclusions from my own observations. By the time that you discovered me upon the moor, I had a complete knowledge of the whole business, but I had not a case which would go to a jury. Even Stapleton's attempt upon Sir Henry that night, which ended in the death of the unfortunate convict, did not help us much in proving murder against our man. There seemed to be no alternative but to catch him red-handed, and to do so we had to use Sir Henry alone and apparently unprotected as a bait. We did so, and at the cost of a severe shock to our client, we succeeded in completing our case and driving Stapleton to his destruction. That Sir Henry should have been exposed to this is, I must confess, a reproach to my management of the case, but we had no means of foreseeing the terrible and paralyzing spectacle which the beasts presented nor could we predict the fog which enabled him to burst upon us at such short notice. We succeeded in our object at a cost which both the specialist and Dr. Mortimer assure me will be a temporary one. A long journey may enable our friend to recover not only from his shattered nerves, but also from his wounded feelings. His love for the lady was deep and sincere and to him the saddest part of all this black business was that he should have been deceived by her. It only remains to indicate the part which she had played throughout. There can be no doubt that Stapleton exercised an influence over her which may have been love, or may have been fear, or very possibly both, since they are by no means incompatible emotions. It was at least absolutely effective. At his command she consented to pass as his sister, though he found the limits of his power over her when he endeavoured to make her the direct accessory to murder. She was ready to warn Sir Henry so far as she could without implicating her husband, and again and again she tried to do so. Stapleton himself seems to have been capable of jealousy, and when he saw the baronet paying court to the lady, even though it was part of his own plan, Still he could not help interrupting with a passionate outburst which revealed the fiery soul which his self-contained manner so cleverly concealed. By encouraging the intimacy, he made it certain that Sir Henry would frequently come to Maripot House, and that he would sooner or later get the opportunity which he desired. On the day of the crisis, however, his wife turned suddenly against him. She had learned something of the death of the convict, and she knew that the hound was being kept in the outhouse on the evening that Sir Henry was coming to dinner. She taxed her husband with his intended crime, and a furious scene followed, in which he showed her for the first time that she had a rival in his love. 
her fidelity turned in an instant to bitter hatred and he saw that she would betray him he tied her up therefore that she might have no chance of warning sir henry and he hoped no doubt that when the whole countryside put down the baronet's death to the curse of his family as they certainly would do he could win his wife back to accept an accomplished fact and to keep silent upon what she knew in this i fancy that in any case he made a miscalculation and that if we had not been there his doom would none the less have been sealed a woman of spanish blood does not condone such an injury so lightly and now my dear watson without referring to my notes i cannot give you a more detailed account of this curious case i do not know that anything essential has been left unexplained he could not hope to frighten sir henry to death as he had done the old uncle with his boggy hound the beast was savage and half starved if its appearance did not frighten its victim to death at least it would paralyze the resistance which might be offered no doubt there only remains one difficulty if stapleton came into the succession how could he explain the fact that he the heir had been living unannounced under another name so close to the property how could he claim it without causing suspicion and inquiry it is a formidable difficulty and i fear that you ask too much when you expect me to solve it the past and the present are within the field of my inquiry but what a man may do in the future is a hard question to answer mrs stapleton has heard her husband discuss the problem on several occasions there were three possible courses he might claim the property from south america establish his identity before the british authorities there and so obtain the fortune without ever coming to england at all or he might adopt an elaborate disguise during the short time that he need to be in london or he might furnish an accomplice with the proofs and papers putting him in as heir and retaining a claim upon some proportion of his income we cannot doubt from what we know of him that he would have found some way out of the difficulty and now my dear watson we have had some weeks of severe work and for one evening i think we may turn our thoughts into more pleasant channels i have a box for les huguenots have you heard the de Reskis? might i trouble you then to be ready in half an hour and we can stop at marcini's for a little dinner on the way End of the Hound of the Baskervilles by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle